Good evening, everyone. My name is Pazina Ahmed. I am the president of the Montgomery County Women's Democratic Club. Thank you all for joining our maternal health webinar this evening. Pregnancy and childbirth should be safe and equitable, but unfortunately that is not the case for many, many women. Today, we hope to raise awareness about maternal health crisis, investing in community-based solutions and mobilizing policy change. In a few minutes, I'm gonna introduce Mona Kishore, our co-chair of community education for the Community Education Committee, who will introduce our exciting panel of prominent maternal health experts and will lead today's discussion. But first, a little bit about WDC. WDC is a membership organization of politically active women and men working to advance democratic policy priorities and elect Democrats up and down the ballot. We work to educate voters on local, state, and national issues of importance to Democrats with a special focus on issues that disproportionately affect women and their children. If you are a member, thank you. And if you're interested in learning more about WDC and becoming a member, you can visit our website at womensdemocraticclub.org. At WDC, we continue to bring you important events, including presentations, um, community dialogues, advocacy efforts, and much more throughout the year. For us to be able to continue to do this important work, we need your support. So please make sure you're renewing your annual membership and consider making an additional donation when and if you can. We also want you to join us by volunteering your time, attending our events, engaging in our advocacy, and sharing information about our work to amplify important issues and voices to bring democratic values to our community now and in the future. Here is a list of our committees if you're interested in getting involved. And here is our executive team. I also wanna give a special thanks to Michael Tardif who's running the Zoom for us this evening and to Mona Kishore for organizing this wonderful webinar. This community education program is one way WDC engages our community in important topics that need our attention. Recent speakers have included this list of phenomenal advocates, authors, and public servants. So a little bit about upcoming events. We only have one upcoming event right now because we're gonna take a little time off for the summer. Um, but WDC on June 30th will hold our annual members meeting via Zoom at 6 p.m. So mark your calendars. And if you're a member, you'll have the opportunity to vote on proposed updates to our bylaws and give your feedback on other club business. And more details will follow. We'll send something out in the newsletter. And now back to today's program. We're so honored to have this distinguished group of women on our panel today. And thank you all for, thank you all for joining us. And I'm, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Mona. So you take it over from here, Mona. Thank you, Tazine. Yes, well, we're very excited today. We're gonna have a webinar focusing on the topic of maternal health. And to kick us off, I'm going to have our esteemed panel of experts introduce themselves. And then we're gonna go around and ask some questions. If you have Q&A, if you have questions yourself from the audience, we do have a designated attendee who is labeled as Q&A in the chat. Please directly message the Q&A to that individual, and we will be collecting questions and providing answers for those at the end with our panel. So to kick us off, I first want to pass it over to Dr. Nina Ashford um, to go through her bio a little bit. And, you know, this is just a snippet of what we've been able to find on our esteemed experts. So really excited to hear more from them today. Dr. Nina Ashford. Can you guys hear me okay? Now we can, yes. Okay, great. Um, first, thank you so much. I am excited to be here with these other phenomenal, accomplished women. So I, um, I look forward to the discussion tonight. I'm currently the Chief of Public Health Services for the Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services. I have been working in public health for the past 16 plus years um, and have had the opportunity to work at multiple levels, um, whether and started actually in community, working in community as a health educator, doing sexual and reproductive health. Um, so I uh, am honored to be able to now bring all of that experience to Montgomery County, which, of which I am a 
proud resident. Um, and I would say the most important thing about me is that I am a mom. I'm a mom of a six-year-old and a two-year-old little boy. And with both of those births, uh, struggled with, but overcame postpartum depression. Um, and so this topic of maternal health is very near and dear to my heart and very personal. It is actually what catapulted my interest and in work in the black in in the maternal health space and specifically the black maternal health space over the past six years. So I am honored to be here. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Dr. Nikila Ruku. Okay. Hi everybody. Can you hear me? Very well. All right. Um, thank you for having me at this wonderful uh, meeting, uh, along with you know, all the lovely presenters as well. My name is Dr. Nikila Ruku. I am a native Marylander. I grew up in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, a little bit about me. I went to University of Maryland. I then followed um, upwards north, went to school in Philadelphia and trained in Mount Sinai in New York. I came back home when I got pregnant and um, continued working here. Uh, again, as uh, Dr. Nina mentioned, I am also a mother of two. And I will say that our work brings much more meaning when you go through the same experiences that your patients do. Um, I have a very special interest in high-risk pregnancies and family planning. And I will say it's an honor to be in Montgomery County. It's an honor to be in Maryland practicing uh, where I feel a lot more free than I feel like the rest of the world, the rest of the country these days. Um, I have a strong practice in Kensington. I take care of women of all walks of life. Uh, I love taking care of women when they start their period, start their you're talking about their contraception at age 15 or 16, whenever they are ready. Um, and, you know, taking care of them when they're ready for their pregnancies, hopefully talking to them and counseling them when they are thinking about pregnancies, which is a true honor because you can really start the process of maternal care prior to them actually conceiving. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's been an honor to take care of women here in, in Montgomery County, and I look forward to being part of this discussion. Thank you. Misha? Hi, everybody. So thank you, WDC, for having me. I'm so excited and thankful for my friend who invited me. I am the only non-Virginia, D.C., Maryland area person um, on the panel because I'm no longer located there. But my heart goes out to all of you because I miss it. Um, I'm currently based in Connecticut. But my name is Misha Hadaway, and I am a licensed clinical social worker and specifically a perinatal therapist um, that works with clients up to and through their journey through motherhood. In addition to that, I'm also a birth doula which I absolutely love because I get to hold a very sacred space um, with a lot of the clients that I see um, through their journeys um, during the, their process of, of childbirth um, and helping them to kind of support whatever it is that they want to accomplish during their um, early childhood journey. Because I'm and I'm excited to do that work in addition to being a therapist, because I get to see sometimes what I do unfold in real time. Um, which is different than a lot of other perinatal therapists. Some people come to this work just because of their birth experience. And for me, it's to try to make other people's birth experiences better um, and more positive. And regardless of whatever their journey was to get there, I want it to um, be a fulfilling kind of experience. Um, I've been a clinical social worker, um, oh my goodness, for over 15 years now, which is crazy to think of, but I have the grades to show. Um, each gray for every client who I've had to rustle up sometimes um, in order to get them to participate fully. Um, I've worked in all different types of settings from direct care work in the community to inpatient psychiatric settings um, to now having my private practice. So I'm very excited to be here. Can't wait to talk about the topic. It's a passion of mine and something I do every day, even when I'm not necessarily sitting in front of clients, I'm doing things like this. I think this might be my um, fourth panel for the month um, and another one next week. So I'm very, very excited. So thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and we'll still accept you, Misha, even though you're not in the DMV. <laughs> thank you, thank uh -huh. you. <laughs> Casey? Uh, good afternoon, or I should say good evening, everyone. I'm excited to be a part of this wonderful panel um, and to talk about a topic that is a very important, important um, topic. 
A um, little bit about me. I am currently the Senior Vice President for Public Policy and government affairs for uh, March of Dimes. Um, it's where I oversee all of our policy efforts from the state to the federal policy. Um, my background, um, and so in, in that job, it is about helping moms and helping babies. My background is that I've got uh, several decades of experience working at all levels of government, um, leading advocacy campaigns, leading um, political campaigns and national campaigns as well. Um, I've had the opportunity to not only elect our first African-American president, President Obama, but served uh, eight years in the Obama-Biden um, administration. It was a great honor. And I am just looking forward to this conversation. I must also share that I am a proud mom of a sixth grader um, and she will be ending sixth grade and moving on to uh, middle school. So that's gonna be something new, but looking forward to the conversation and nice meeting everyone. Wonderful, thank you. And, and as the audience probably has heard, we're incredibly lucky to have this panel as everyone brings something very unique. You know, we're trying to talk about this behemoth topic in a way that encompasses so many things, the elements of mental care, medical care, as well as policy and advocacy. So I, I would be remiss to not start off by saying whatever we cover today is probably um, the smallest percentage of knowledge on this topic. Um, and I really hope and wish that it spurns more deep diving from everybody. To start us off, you know, a lot of people are not aware of what all is encompassed in that term, maternal health. So this is a question, Dr. Ashford, I was hoping you could address for our audience first. How would you define that topic of maternal health? And if you could delve a little bit on how it's measured or what metrics apply to it. Yes, absolutely. So when we think about maternal health and the definition of that, we're specifically talking about the health of a woman or birthing person during their pregnancy, the actual childbirth, and in that postnatal uh, period. I would actually expand that definition to include the full postpartum period up to a year. And I would also expand that definition to include preconception care. As Dr. Iruku mentioned, before you become pregnant, you need to be engaged in preconception care because there are a lot of things that can happen prior to becoming pregnant that can impact the outcomes of your pregnancy. So I would make a friendly amendment to uh, adjust that technical definition in that way. When we talk about how, and, and I would say that maternal health, it encompasses our physical health, our mental health, as well as our emotional health. All of those things are included when we talk about the health of a mom or the health of a birthing person. There are lots of different ways we measure maternal health. Um, I think the one that we see a lot in the headlines, unfortunately, is maternal mortality. So looking at actual deaths of women that occur while they are pregnant or within 42 days of being pregnant um, from any cause related to or aggravated by that pregnancy. Um, we can also measure maternal health by looking at perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. So postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, postpartum um, uh, OCD, and, and, and the broad umbrella of PMADs that exist. Uh, we can also measure maternal health by looking at maternal morbidity. So those are those short and long-term health problems that result from being pregnant and giving birth, right? So some of those things are things like cardiovascular disease, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, infection, bleeding, um, as well as severe maternal morbidity, which are really uh, the, the very severe unexpected outcomes that happen during that labor and delivery process that lead to either short-term or long-term health outcomes. And we've seen that severe maternal morbidity is actually increasing over the years. Um, so that is how I would define and measure maternal health. And it's really interesting that you know, you know, the 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 potential repercussions or research around, you know, women post childbirth. I yeah, I've also heard of studies and analyses for women to consider if they don't have childbirth. You know, so it goes back to 
it's really not just for women who are pregnant, but even pre-pregnant. And that sort of leads me to my next question for you, Dr. Aruku, around what are some unique issues or concerns that women have when it relates to health care? I mean, me, myself, I think one of the things I always think of is women just we have to see practitioners a lot more than men generally do. So what are things that you wish your patients knew before they came to you? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think um, some of the unique issues for women are what is normal and what is not normal, but also what um, what can be taken, how you can care for yourself in preparation for a pregnancy possibly, um, or to prevent a pregnancy, you know? So uh, what, I, I see this a lot in my adolescent population where they talk about their periods and they have no idea what is normal and some things are cultural. So in patients of uh, women of color, you know, our African-American population, Patients say that their periods are normal. And then when you break it down, they are hemorrhaging every month. So really trying to teach these things early when we see our patients early. Um, in addition to that, some of these can also point us on how to care for them in terms of, um, you know, what what women face a lot more of our uterine fibroids, sometimes endometriosis. So teaching them that these symptoms can be correlated and how that may um, have long-term implications, whether that be infertility, whether that be having a high-risk pregnancy because of very large uterine fibroids. So yes, we, we would love to see our women much earlier, um, usually by the time they're 21, 22, just so that we can have, number one, a very um, a comfortable relationship with them where they know us, they trust us, they're able to share silly things through their through the years with us. And then when it comes to understanding the educational part, we were able to contribute that pretty early in their life. Now when it comes to maternal health, I will say um, in in recent years, I think for the past 10, 15 years, we've been seeing a lot more of in previously we would we would talk about high-risk pregnancies, but right now what we learn is more of the chronic conditions. So we've been seeing patients that are much sicker who are not even pregnant that get pregnant. And so we're dealing with a lot of their chronic conditions in the pregnancy. So again, um, trying to meet them early, have that preconception counseling, trying to teach them about preventive care, whether that be diabetes care, high blood pressure, obesity, and healthy living, movement, um, all of those things, I think, play a huge role in how we not only prevent maternal morbidity, prevent preterm um, labor, uh, NICU deliveries. And I will applaud, you know, our team from the March of Dimes there. They do such wonderful work with this. And uh, I think it's really important to start early. And so women, I I, I love meeting them early in their uh, in the reproductive years. So we can talk about contraception, talk about preconception counseling, and then guide them if there is concerns for um, high-risk pregnancies or even infertility. I really love that because in many ways, it's sort of addressing the need to have a baseline to then know what is abnormal for a patient. Um, I'm also very intrigued by you know, a lot of people are probably coming in thinking they just don't have the the vocabulary or their their communities do not share as much about these topics. So, you know, that is a very interesting point about not knowing what is typical. Um, Stacy, I, I would love to have you address this next question, which is, more so on the maternal death rate and morbidity, do you see that, I mean, as a society, we keep on talking about ourselves as evolving. You would assume that those rates would decrease and hopefully across all populations. Could you speak a bit about what are the trends today and how they differ by different groups? Sure, gladly. Um, so let me just start by sharing that the recent CDC 
um, data suggests that was released regarding the maternal mortality data. It finds that a number of women are dying from pregnancy related issues and that it remains at a high level. And in fact, I'll share some, some more statistical data with you. 817 deaths were reported in 2022, reflecting a significant decline in the maternal mortality rate compared to 2021. And when it's normally over 1,200 maternal deaths that were reported. So why there seems to be, or CDC has reported that there is a decline, there's that's a small decline because we still have OD, over 80% pregnancy de deaths related to pregnancy complications here in the United States of America. And so the disparities still do exist. I mean, despite the decline, uh, the mortality rate is still very high and it's very high for, for black women, it's very high for women of color. Um, and, it and we continue to experience the greater risk of deaths during pregnancy. Um, within 42 days of a pregnancy, we have a maternal rate nearly three times higher than the maternal rate for um, women of non-color, for white women. Um, there were several things that actually contributed to the CDC's, CDC's report showing that there was a, a small decline. Um, we look at things in terms of, um, we looked at things that related to like the COVID, COVID factors that take place. We've looked at some of the things in terms of policies that have been put in place uh, with more advanced take towards uh, telehealth. Um, so there are a couple of things that we can point to that contribute to this, but I think what's important by the mere fact that WDC is actually holding this and we have people joining us virtually for this panel discussion shows how important it is and why you hear so many people across the country um, continuing to talk about what it is we need to be doing in our communities. And so I can tell you, you've, I've heard one of the other panelists say uh, just a few minutes ago that there are a lot of things that are contributing to this. It is cardiovascular conditions. It's hypertensive disorders. It's uh, preeclampsia as one of the key drivers. So one in 25 pregnancies in the U.S. Um, are potential impact had potential impacts due to uh, for pregnant people um, doing uh, this time of, of maternal um, maternal delivery as well. So I think there's a lot that can be done, but there are a lot of factors and it does negatively impact women of color at a higher rate um, than, it do, than it does other women. And Stacy, one thing that, you know, um, comes to mind as it relates to Montgomery County is access to resources or services, I should say, private and public. Um, and there was a book by Dr. Travis Gales that was back in 2018, sort of talking about a tale of two counties relating women of, of different populations and their, you know, uh, different rates of mortality. Can you speak to that service disparity? I mean, there is there is absolutely, you know, many services here, we're very fortunate to be in a large metropolitan area really close to the national capital. But what are some things that you're seeing from a service perspective that really drive that disparity? So for March of Dimes being a national organization, um, we're able to look at national priorities and how those national priorities are feeding to our own state's initiatives and being able to look at state initiatives and how um, they're also feeding um, to the national perspective. And so some, sometimes the policies become a little bit more, more difficult to find the success that's, mm -hmm. that's addressing the communities of color. But I would point to um, the Maternal Health Act of 2024 um, that Maryland was successfully able to pass. And that was done with the Maryland Department of Health and looking at how they made parental risk assessment forms and postpartum infant maternal um, referral programs available electronically. Um, there have been things in terms of how we look at high risk patients and looking at those deliveries within those 48 hours. I know that uh, speaking more specifically for the state of Maryland, the state 
state of Maryland has been doing a great job, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, the state of Maryland has actually scored. So March of Dimes puts together uh, annual report card. And that report card rates the states, it looks at the counties, it looks at the services, it looks at the support that is coming um, collectively um, for women of women across the board, for all or, or birthing people across the board. And so in terms of Maryland looking at this, what your local elected officials and your state officials and your leadership at the federal level have been able to put into place. I'm happy to report that Maryland is actually scoring, um, should actually serve as the example along with the state of New Jersey in terms of how you're drawing attention to the need for how we address maternal health um, across uh, across the state. Um, we're looking at in Maryland, something else I want to just call to the attention for everybody on the panel, but also those who are joining us, is that Maryland has created a report card. I'm looking at your birthing facilities. Um, you're looking at and tracking components of um, what you're looking at to improve the outcome. So it's one of the great states, but there's still more work to do. I will tell you that uh, Maryland also has led the way in terms of Medicaid expansion and extension for postpartum coverage. Um, and that's being able to deliver those services to go past and onward to 12 months. Um, you're starting to look at the state across the board. And again, it's because we look at it nationally. We have to zero in when we issue this national report card on what's happening at the states. And so Mona, I'm actually answering the question and probably giving a lot more data. I love your it. Question. I didn't know all this. <laughs> So probably give a little bit more data to what the state specifically has been doing, but I think it is good to uh, to highlight, you know, what the data shows from the CDC, highlight what we've been able to find out, and then also share more importantly about what the state of um, Maryland has been doing to address it. Um, you've come up with collaboratives. You've got great maternal mortality reviews that are in place. We're looking at fetal infant um, mortality review committees. All these things continue to look at how the state wants to address it. And it also feeds into what we're doing, March of Dimes nationally, but what other organizations um, are focusing on to be able to address the maternal um, mortality crisis. Well, I'm, I'm always proud to say I'm a Marylander and I'm a transplant from California. Um, so I'm even more proud to hear that. Uh, but, you know, it does sound like there's so much around, you know, the birthing mother or individual going through these maternal health situations. Some you can control, some you cannot. This next question, Misha, I really want to address to you more because, you know, with so much out of the hands of, let's just say, the, the patient how do you prepare women to, to start this journey, which may have a lot of sharp turns and unexpected things thrown at them? I mean, from my, from my female friend circle, not a single one of us had a birth plan that went to plan. <laughs> so, it, you know, expecting the unexpected is the norm. So I'd love for you to speak to that if you can. Yeah, and I appreciated a couple of things that both um, Nina said and um, Dr. Roku. Like, I loved the fact that like, um, I think someone said like normalizing the normal um, or normalizing what's not normal. Like I tried to normalize the normal for my clients. So like discussing with them, like what could be anticipated when the unexpected occurs, like having a plan for that, right? Like in therapy, um, specifically, since that's my area of focus, right, is to work with the client to help them to look at not just things that are in my control um, and that could be normal, but also the things that are not in my control because those could also be normal too, right? Like you hear, unfortunately, that women of color have more fertility challenges, right? We have more um, fibroids, we have more preterm births, right? We have more um, low birth weight babies, right? We have more complications during those processes, which are unfortunately normal. But when you're writing a birth plan, you don't think about those things. So in your eyes, that's not something that's normal for you. So it's identifying what is normal for that person, depending on their um, physical attributes. So do they have any um, um, 
issues that are predetermined based on their weight or size or race. Um, but then discussing kind of mental health as well. So like someone who has anxiety before they have a baby is more than likely going to have anxiety when they're pregnant and then thusly have anxiety after the baby's born. So can we talk about different skills and things that you have that um, maybe could set you up for more success to deal with your anxiety? How do we include your provider in that conversation? Um, how do we discuss what your triggers are? Um, and even if you don't write a birth plan, like what are some things that the provider needs to know about you that could heighten your risk? Unfortunately, most of maternal deaths are preventable. Um, and you're going to hear, like, I loved all the statistics from um, Stacy because there's um, you hear a lot of 80%, which is unfortunate. I mean, if I was in school, like I would love to get that because I'm passing. But in this field, 80% isn't, isn't helpful. And then you're going to hear a lot of like um, two times the rate, right? Um, and recently, as of this year, um, Postpartum Support International, which is the organization that I'm certified through, um, has identified that the rate prior to this year for people who have... Um, perinatal mood disorders was one in seven. And it's unfortunately now increased to one in five. Um, and we're going in the wrong direction, right? We're not seeing people that are getting better. Unfortunately, like we've heard already that people are getting sicker. Um, and so also kind of having that conversation with people because 80% of providers who are seeing birthing people after they've given birth are not asking what their mood, their mood is and how they're feeling. They're talking about physical symptoms, but I try not to ask my clients, are they feeling anxious? Because not everybody identifies anxiety the same. So tell me what your symptoms are. Like if you're not sleeping, tell me why, right? If you're not eating, tell me why. Like it could just be you have a newborn baby and it's hard, like, but there could be something else that's connected to that and it could be a mood disorder. Um, and in other facets, like I think the other thing to think of is unfortunately, like we have a system that's unsafe for women to birth in. And so you're also going into it with that expectation, like you're normalizing the normal, unfortunately, where like, I'm terrified to have this baby. I'm terrified to even get pregnant. Like I'm terrified to even consider what that might look like. Um, and so addressing that mental health component with their fear of that disparity can sometimes be helpful. And again, even if you don't write a birth plan, talking about what's making you afraid. Unfortunately, pregnancy is synonymous with anxiety. And wow. there isn't a person who's pregnant that isn't also anxious. Yeah, it, it sounds like the seesaw, right? And, and you got to strike a balance. If your mental health is down, your your physical health will likely follow. But it's interesting. I like the way that you say it, that both have to be in check. Um, as a society, we often focus on the physical and not the mental, but it's, mm -hmm. it's about the whole patient. It is. It's the whole care right of that person it can't just be one or the other um because i can't just address someone's mental health needs without also con consulting with their doctor because i have a lot of clients who maybe are on medication and maybe they're thinking of conception um and they could have medication that's counterindicated for pregnancy um and what do they do a lot of my clients will be like well i'm just going to stop taking my medicine and that is not the answer, like, right? That is not, you should never just do that. You have to consult your provider. Um, but sometimes they're afraid to do that because maybe they don't know, right? Like they haven't had that preconception conversation around what to expect um, with their medication. Um, they're unfortunately turning to Google um, and Google will give you the answer you're looking for every time, um, but it might not be the right answer for you. Exactly. Yeah, I, I love that. Thank you so much, Misha. I, I mean, turning it to a provider, <laughs> Dr. Uruku, I would love to hear from you on how do you address these topics in a, um, you know, perinatal conversation with your patients to make sure that they're taking care of themselves holistically? Yeah. Um, Mona, thank you. I actually have to say something, Misha, I'm, I'm floored. I will say this is one of my pet peeves of feeling like people can walk in with a birth plan and think that happens. And absolutely, when you walk in and you are rigid to, um, you know, it's like saying, like writing down directions of how to change your tire and going to a mechanic, right? 
I mean, they unfortunately have the, the, the expertise of sometimes things may have to be done differently. Um, and, and absolutely, I think the conversation about what is normal, what may not be in our control, and you know what are the triggers? If you are feeling anxious, what are the triggers? How can we have that direct conversation when you're in labor? Because yes, things can go haywire, but at the same time, we, you know, we're a team, we work together. And if there is, um, you know, a support system around you, whether that be sometimes people want their partners, sometimes people don't want their partner, they would prefer their mother and their best friend. Um, and just kind of having all of those instituted even before you go into the labor process, instead of feeling like it's me versus them, it's it's a whole team that works together. And I think that um, that really helps us get a sense of we're going to do everything we can to, number one, make you feel comfortable and then also try to you know, keep our eyes out for any pre-existing conditions that can be increasing your risk of maternal morbidity and mortality. So my job is to keep everybody safe, but I completely agree. I think pregnancy is not just those 10 months, um, popular to believe it's not nine months, it's yeah. 10 months, um, but also the pre-pregnancy, the pregnancy, and then the whole year after that it really takes a lot of time for women to recover and postpartum depression is real and the care that you receive, the bonding that you have um, with your child in that time, which unfortunately in America is extremely shortened, um, is is key to to the well being of the mother, the well being of the family. Um, and and I forgot your question, Mona. If you don't mind repeating that one more time for me. Yes, it, it's how do you have that conversation with your patients when they come in pre you know pre plan to mm -hmm. sort of what things should they be thinking about? Like you said, if they are to be flexible. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's it's a, a great idea to kind of step back and say, all right, let's talk about everything from head to toe, right? So what are your medical conditions? What surgeries have you had that can put you at high risk? How are your periods? Do you have regular periods? Are you on any medications, right? Have you ever had prior pregnancies where you've had complications? And uh, same things with the medical conditions. If they are already coming in, they're uh, pre-diabetic with large hemoglobin A1Cs, which are numbers that we evaluate to see if they um, that their diabetes is managed or not, you know, let's start tackling these things and let's give ourselves a certain amount of time before we consider getting pregnant, right? So we want to optimize your health before you do get pregnant. Um, I think weight is a big one in America. So, you know, we see a lot of women that are starting off with a higher body mass index. And some of it, I will say, is um, we have to take that into uh, a little bit more of a grain, grain of salt. We have to look at it um, more detailed because, you know, a BMI on a woman who is South Asian, Southeast Asian, like me with a BMI of 50 versus a BMI of 40 in a woman of color, they're different because the way that we are built are different. And so I not body shaming somebody or even, you know, trying to just blanketly saying, hey, you need to lose weight, really working with them as to understanding what are the reasons? Is there an underlying thyroid condition of you know, are there um, hormonal abnormalities that we can work with? Or is it primarily lifestyle? And how can we help you break it down? So sometimes we, we work with nutritionists, we work with the internists. Um, and I definitely think uh, the mental health aspect is huge. So if you are on medications, instead of stopping your medications, understanding that you can switch over to something that's safe in pregnancy uh, and doing that early, doing it early so that we can help you, um, you know, have the preg pregnancy that you would like, make sure that you are healthy, make sure you have a healthy delivery and a healthy baby. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think sadly, I don't know about others on, on the panel, if you were like myself, you know, many of us didn't think about going to our, our, you know, general physician um, pre starting to conceive or um, all these things. So yeah, I, I love that idea of sort of planning it out, thinking about optimizing for the best outcome, which I think 
we just don't prepare for, even though it's such a big life change and decision. So. Yeah. I will say in this aspect, there's a huge health discrepancy or disparity. Um, I think women that are educated, that have are either middle class or upper middle class, usually tend more so to be aware of what to look out for, how to have these conversations with their providers. Whereas women that are of the lower socioeconomic strata, the younger patients who are not planning on getting pregnancies. I mean, I the the term oops pregnancy really, I don't love it at all. I, I would love to erase that from, you know, the dictionary. But I think when people get pregnant without either their own choice um, and also get pregnant without really having the opportunity to have health care, right? So when you get pregnant, you get insurance. A lot of women walk around without insurance, without any health um, health care in general. And so once they get pregnant, it's too late, right? If you're already having um, your hypertensive at three different medications, you have a hemoglobin A1C of 10, which is very high, um, or are on medications that are not safe in pregnancy, by the time you get insurance and you see us, you're probably around 10 to 10, eight to 10 weeks. And, you know, most of the, um, the, the, the fetus has been, is, is grown, right? All the anatomy is done. So it's really important to understand that maternal health care starts pre pregnancy. And so, trying to make sure that healthcare is available to women, um, it, well, not just because they're pregnant, but because you know we, we live in a first world country, not a third world country, and most third world countries have healthcare for all. Um, and so just being cognizant of the fact that preventive care is the key to, to healthcare or health in general. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And in, and in many ways, you know, hearing, um, the scorecard of Maryland that Stacy shared, I'm, you know, we're probably all feeling very good about at least the support network that we have here in Maryland. I wanted to address the next question to you, Dr. Nina Ashford, because when we were preparing for this webinar, something that was such a tease was something that you said, which is there is so much about our history that shapes our maternal health. Um, and those words have echoed in my mind and I was hoping you could expand on that. What has brought us to this point in our country and in Maryland? Yeah, so I would be, I could probably talk for hours about this topic. Um, and I think when I say about our history, I'm talking specifically about some of the disparities that we see. And like Stacy highlighted, Maryland as a state is doing really well. Montgomery County is actually, according to the county health ranking, still the healthiest county in the state of Maryland and one of the healthiest counties in the nation. But when you disaggregate those outcomes by race and ethnicity, Black birthing people in Montgomery County are almost three times more likely to go with late or no prenatal care. They have infant mortality rates that are 2.8 times higher than their white counterparts. And they're also 1.24 times more likely to have preterm births. So when we talk about data and outcomes, it's really important for us to disaggregate by race and ethnicity to be able to see not everybody isn't enjoying those benefits, right? There are still people that are um, being impacted. And when we look at those present day maternal health disparities, we have to look at our history, right? We have to look at the history of Black people in this country. You know, we take it all the way back to 1619, which is a very great body of work if folks have not read it. But, you know, when with women and birthing people lost autonomy over their bodies and their personhood when they were brought over um, as uh, when they were brought over as uh, enslaved individuals, right? When the slave trade was banned, that put a very high value on back black birthing bodies because now that was the supply for the individuals who were going to continue the slave trade. Um, when we look at Dr. Marion Sims, who's often viewed as the modern day father, uh, the father of modern gynecology, right? Most of the, many of the current uh, gynecological procedures that are used to this day were actually conducted, refined, and uh, identified on enslaved black women 
without anesthesiology or without anesthesia, without any type of pain, because there was also this racist belief that black individuals and Africans did not experience pain, right? And so we often credit Lucy and Arca and Betsy as being the godmothers of modern, modern gynecology. And Arca had over 30 procedures as a 17 year old enslaved woman with no anesthesia after a traumatic labor and delivery to perfect his method for repairing a vaginal fistula, right? Um, and we see this throughout history where women and Black women in particular were not being listened to. Black women not being listened to is a big reason why we see the maternal deaths that we see to this day, whether it is an embolism. Serena wasn't listened to, and if she hadn't advocated for herself, would she still be here, right? But that trickles down, whether you talk about redlining back in the 50s when communities of color were systematically barred from getting FHA loans to buy housing, that systematic segregation still exists in terms of where our healthcare deserts are, where the low quality hospitals are, where poverty is, right? Your ability to have health insurance is a huge predictor of your outcomes. Medicaid is a great tool, but unfortunately, because of the reimbursement rates, a lot of providers don't take Medicaid. That is just another form of systemic segregation, right? Um, our maternity care deserts, all of these inequities are actually rooted in the foundation and history of this country. And we have never had a conversation as a nation to really sit down and rectify how that is still embedded into our current healthcare delivery system bias um, and how women and birthing people are bearing the, the brunt of that, right? Um, and so when we think about maternal health outcomes and we think about maternal health disparities, we have to understand that very real history is still very much living um, within the systems that are here to provide care, but also within the patients that show up to the hospital. I had a birthing plan with my first child with all the things, didn't happen. My second birthing plan said, I don't want to die. That was my birthing plan. I just want me and my baby to leave the hospital alive. And I was serious. I wrote it on my patient provider communication board. I, I also don't want that to be the norm, right? Because having a baby, being able to become a mother, if you choose to do so, it should be a joyful experience um, and not filled with fear and not filled with anxiety. But as Misha said, pregnancy and anxiety, <laughs> they tend to go hand in hand. It's a very anxiety provoking experience. Um, but it is really important for us to understand the history of healthcare, of women's health, of how we deliver care to women and how we are seeing that actually permeate and come through in our modern day health disparities. And I, that really resonates because, you know, when we think about there's advancements happening all around us with technology, with medicine, it, it I think it, it's one of my pains that we're not seeing more advancements, you know, in this area, especially when it comes to access to this information. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even just having a panel like this, while open and available to everybody, you know, it's it's not going to make its way to all those who need to hear this information. Um, you know, one of the things I, uh, Stacy, you were talking about how Maryland is graded as a C, which, you know, as a, as an A student, that does not cut it for me. Um, but Montgomery County is luckily a B. What can we do to get better? Uh, maybe an A is not achievable right now, but, uh, you know, at least get a little bit better than where we are today. So when well, I'll tell you in listening, such a wonderful discussion, and I do agree, we could have this conversation and go on for hours because there's so much that we collectively can be doing. Um, and it starts with uh, one, advocating. Um, it starts with educating. Um, and it starts with doing what um, WDC is doing tonight, which is raising um, awareness, raising the visibility, having the conversations, um, making sure uh, you do call out um, because of racial disparities that exist um, that with these grades or whether improvements that are happening in Montgomery County or a C being for um, the state of Maryland, that there's still, as I stated earlier, there's still a lot of work um, that needs to be done to improve maternal health care across the board. 
Um, I heard, heard a little bit earlier stated, uh, there's also an increase with the need for, uh, and I talked about reimbursements through um, ex Medicaid extension and expansion, but um, looking at reimbursements for doula coverage and having midwives to be able to, to go in with families. And we, we talked about the birthing plans and just your birthing plan, you know, hearing that conversation about your plan is you just want to be able to go through this and come out alive. I think solutions start with awareness and that's what we're doing here. And then when you are aware of the issues, you're able to take actions um, that can improve the outcomes for moms and babies. And so I think the solutions are multi-prone. I think you've got, there's not going to be one fix that's going to fix this crisis um, across the country, um, nor is it going to be one solution prone that's going to fix what's happening um, in Maryland, what's happening in Montgomery County um, and several other counties within the state. But I think that looking at policy recommendations, um, drawing public drawing public views um, to what's happening um, plays a role. I think looking at if there is, um, and we know that there is, we have something that's the Maternity Care Desert Report, which kind of says where you live matters. Um, we're looking at that there's a decline in terms of um, obstetricians that are going into um, providing coverage. So there's a lot that plays a role, but I think how you or how we or people who are listening um, can look at how we look at, how do we close that gap? How do we continue to push our legislators um, at the state, the local and at the national level and looking at ways to provide and expand access? so that we can change those outcomes. I think we've got to look at initiatives um, that address uh, transportation. When we start talking about there are rural parts of Maryland, just like I'm in Virginia, there are rural parts of Virginia. Um, and then where there's not, it's how do you address the transportation, the transportation needs to be able to get individuals um, to medical appointments? How do we make people understand that it's okay that you can have a doula, that you can understand having a midwife that's there for you? I think we've got to look at ways that we hold um, our elected officials and our policymakers um, accountable for being able to have um, uh, racial bias training that is given in these hospitals um, so that when someone who walks in that looks like me um, or Dr. Nisha, you don't make an assumption, or any of us, that you don't make an assumption that we don't know. And I heard Dr. Rukas mention it earlier, that we don't understand what's happening um, with our body and because of our body makeup, how we're being treated when we walk in, because our, our viewpoint and where we come from um, may be very different. And when I use the term we, I mean in terms of um, women of color. I think, you know, with your question of how can we improve the maternal health um, um, outcome, I think Again, making sure people know that HRSA has um, a hotline that you can call that is, um, I think it is 1-800, um, let me look, I wrote this down, I want to make sure I sell, oh, 1-800-TLC-MAMA, like making sure people know if you're dealing with postpartum depression, because I also suffered, I heard another panelist say it earlier, I also suffered with postpartum depression after giving birth to my daughter. So knowing that you've got to be able to advocate, not be afraid to speak, knowing that it's okay to take somebody with you into the room, um, understanding that there are funds that are available that, that are actually supporting things like this, um, these hotlines for you to be able to call into. Also looking at what counties and states and what we can do as individuals who join in, um, being active and making sure that um, we're educating others. I think another thing I, I always, I would, my team would hold this against me if I didn't say it. I think it is encouraging people to pick up their phone, call their congressional members and say, hey, we need you to, to reauthorize legislation like the Premier Act. We need you to support um, PMDA. There, there are several things, but it's about, again, getting the word out, holding people accountable, pointing out the differences, highlighting what's working, looking at what is not working um, collectively across the board. And that's not only just with policies, but what our providers are also giving us as, as well. And looking at the impact and the differences between rural and urban and those impacts on those families, those moms, those birthing people. I thank you so much for that. And I know um, our producer, Michael, put the number in the chat. It's 1-800-TLC-MAMA. -M -M -A. 
And so I apologize that I, I I could continue. I think I just went through half of my questions. I want this to, to be another hour, but we have had some questions come through from the audience. And there's one especially that I wanted to open and sort of end with each of the panelists, uh, you know, potentially giving your perspective on this question. It sounds like there is this, this very early stage need for education, for awareness, and that largely is driven by having access points, being able to talk about these topics even as early on as when you're an adolescent. How do you think we can improve in disseminating this knowledge to younger women? So, I, Misha, do you want to take that first? I, I mean, I think, um, you know, as someone who probably works with several people even before they, you know, start down that birthing journey, uh, feel free to answer. Sure, thank you. Um, so I think it's, it's there's so, such a multifaceted question. So I'm like, where do I jump in and say this? And I don't want to say anything that's going to steal someone else's like piece. So like <laughs> part of part of it, I think, is um, as soon as you as as a person who has children, right? Like, or a person who's around children, as soon as you get the inkling that that person might become sexually active is a time to start this conversation, right? Because I think we're waiting until we have the contraception conversation um, or we're waiting until we're like graduating college or we've established a career in some cases where that's when we're then thinking about having kids and that's when we consider it. And for some people that's too late because now they're looking at fertility or we're looking at a geriatric pregnancy or something where you're over a certain age and you're considered old. Um, but you're not. Um, I think that that's something to consider because if there's a person in your life who's potentially thinking of having children, they need to know this information. They need to know, like, again, for mental health, that left untreated, the issues could be significant, not just for you, but also for your children. Like, and as parents, right, like, do we're, I think, always trying to achieve better for our kids, right? And so I think when you're having the conversation about contraception, there should be a conversation about, like, pregnancy and, um, fertility or loss or trauma, like, right, not, and mental health, like, not just when you're becoming of age and now want to start a family, but it should be, like, you're talking about condoms with your, with your son, like, you should be talking about child rearing, right? Like, if you're talking about birth control, you should be talking about one day, if you want to have kids, what does it look like? Um, but I think as soon as possible, because in my practice, I do preconception conversations with people, um, through all walks of life. Um, and I also work with partners, so not just the birthing person, um, to help them also have that conversation around like, do I want to grow a family? And it could be easy peasy and it could be that unfortunate oops pregnancy situation, like a happy, excited, wanted pregnancy. It could be I struggle to get here pregnancy, but in any of those situations, typically we don't know about it until we're experiencing it. So if we could have the conversation before we even get there, I think that would be a way to address it. I love that because you want to go, just like we were saying, we want a normalized definition of maternal health. You want to be going into these situations with your partner or significant other with the same basis of knowledge. And I think that's always, that's often overlooked. Um, Dr. Uruku, same question to you. Yeah, thank you. Um... I was going to say that very early on, women, girls, um, get the sense of what being healthy is, how to look, how to behave, how to act. Um, and what I would love for our society, I don't necessarily think education is just with the provider. I think it is a community-driven thing. Um, it can start in their churches. It can start in their temples. It can start with you know schools, community-based groups. And a lot of it has to do with what our, our definition of health is. And when we're talking about health, when people start saying, oh yeah, I'm eating vegetables and I'm eating healthy, it's because they want to lose weight or fit into a certain dress or look a certain way or 
whatever they're seeing on Instagram these days. But I think women are fed trash. They really need to be taught that you are healthy because you are, you know, it's not really how you look, how you, what you wear, but it's about what, how you care for yourself, mind, body, and soul, right? So movement is helpful. Body composition is helpful. So it's not just that you're 120 pounds, but truly like, are you strong, right? And that is something that we need to have early that conversation that kind of education ha- needs to happen early and i think a lot of the um changes that occur by true self care by truly asking people to um you know make these changes early in their life not just because you have to look a certain way but care for yourself in preparation for just your own health journey i think that takes you a long way into maternal health when you are ready to conceive, um, not to mention contraceptive care, I think that really helps to have that conversation early as well. Thank you. And I'm going to pass the question now over to you, Dr. Nina Ashford, but I'm going to give you double work in that. I want you to also talk about the wealth of activities and advocacy and work that I know you're doing in your work as it relates to this topic, getting this awareness um, to so many of us in Montgomery County. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say thinking about this from a, I would love for there to be, there should be comprehensive sex education in all schools. So let's start very young, Um, but also thinking about, you know, each one teach one. As Dr. Roku said, it's about community. Each of us are parts of community. If you map out your circle of power and influence, right? There are many touch points there. And so this is not just for a webinar. These are conversations you should be having with your group chat, right? Are there women and birthing people in your group chat that you know they might not be ready for pregnancy yet, but they're gonna be there someday? Let's get them the information and knowledge, your church, your social club. So think local. It doesn't have to be a, you know, statewide social marketing campaign on the side of a a WMATA bus. Like it can literally be a conversation with your girlfriends so that they can pay it forward. Um, I would say um, in terms of Montgomery County uh, specifically, so one of the nice things is with the Healthy Babies Equity Act, it allowed all women and birthing people to get uh, Medicaid coverage, regardless of their citizen status, so citizenship status. So that went into effect last year. So we now are getting more birthing people access to care. Um, And then as I believe Stacey mentioned, the Maternal Health Act of 2024, um, those prenatal risk assessments that all of the hospitals will be required to fill out, those now come to my team so that we can connect high risk moms to the services and the care that they need once they deliver. Um, We have our Montgomery perinatal program that provides home-based case management services to our at-risk pregnant and uh, parenting families that live in the county. Um, We have our Babies Born Healthy program, which focuses specifically on our African-American moms who are uh, to help our um, at-risk moms and connect them with resources. This is specifically for our moms with Medicaid, but we also have our SMILE program, Starting More Infants Living Equitably through our African-American Health Program that provides childbirth and breastfeeding education classes and case management, and there are no income requirements or restrictions here. So you can have a higher income and still receive services through SMILE, our SMILE program. Um, I would say we have the Postpartum Support International through uh, Maryland has a chapter. This is a huge resource for uh, mental health um, as well. So there are a lot of resources within Montgomery County for moms, for birthing people. And I would say don't sleep on, while they might not be Montgomery County specific, there are really great social clubs. Motherhood, especially new motherhood, can be very isolating. This process of matrescence of where you become a mom is a shock to the system in every word. So I, you know, groups like District Motherhood, um, Six Cool Moms, right? There's lots of different groups whether there's social groups or Facebook groups within Montgomery County, PACE programs are really, really useful tools um, for moms and birthing people. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashford. And Stacy, um, to wrap us up, 
would love for you to say a little bit about how March of Dimes is working to get awareness out there. I think many of us know March of Dimes as a, you know, household brand. It's an organization we've known for generations, but what are some things that you would love the audience to know about March of Dimes and its work? Um, excuse me. Uh, so March of Dimes has been around for, and before I jump into telling you about March of Dimes, I love all the comments that all the panelists um, spoke about. And this has been something that has become and is um, something I am very passionate about and listening to what is happening um, in Montgomery County, listening to uh, what Misha and what Dr. Ruku are, are talking about, Ruku are talking about is very important. And I think the work that we all individually are doing, um, if it is being the physician that is giving the care, if it is being the person who's educating, if it's the person that's overseeing and looking at pre perinatal data that's coming in with these programs. Um, March of Dimes it believes in if you have a healthy mom and a healthy baby, um, it's the direction in which we're moving towards. We're doing this through a lot of our advocacy, we're doing it through a lot of our research, and we're doing it through a lot of our education. Um, we continue to uh, have the conversations at all levels. We're looking at ways that we continue to engage our youth. Um, I mean, and our youth, and that means even our, our, our little ones um, in middle school, at middle school and elementary school, to be able to talk about why March of Dimes, why Healthy Mom um, is important. And the one thing, healthy moms, healthy birthing people. And what I would just kind of tell you from the perspective, from my perspective, it is always being able to be out front, always talking about the issue is something that March of Dimes continues to do. We continue to look at uh, various research. Uh, we're actually um, now going to be launching and have launched a low dose aspirin campaign. Um, we have partnered with Alex Felix, um, who just who, who's, who's just gave birth, who actually took a low dose aspirin um, each day during her pregnancy. And that is to help something that we, we mentioned, but I want to make sure that I mentioned, which is preeclampsia that a lot of women suffer with um, during their during their pregnancy. So, again, um, drawing attention taking time to join uh, conversations like this. I'm continuing to ask people to join the March of Dimes Advocacy Network um, and calling on individuals regardless of um, where you live, holding your elected officials and leaders um, accountable, but also knowing that you don't have to be an elected official or a person who is actually in the maternal health space or in the health space, but knowing that caring about healthy moms, healthy birthing people um, impacts all of us uh, across the board. Because the one thing we all can agree to is that we all have um, a mom. And that's the one thing March of Dimes is spending a lot of time talking about. You actually stole my line, Stacey. I was just about to say, we all have a mother. Um, <laughs> but I love it. And and just to wrap it all off, I think it, it. what I'm taking away is we also all have a role in this, whatever, yes. you know, little or Absolutely. big role that is. All of you contribute tremendously. And we thank you so much for the time and the knowledge um, and, and just... We really appreciate all of the audience joining us today. Uh, and to wrap things off, I was just going to hand it back to our WDC president, Tazine, to say a couple words. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. And thank you for all of the guests here today. Um, it's been an incredible experience. And I'm a recent grandmother, so we have had some experiences in the last two months that have been harrowing. So a lot of what you said really sort of, um, you know, I, I could emphasize, you know, sort of um, relate to. Um, so just a couple of things um, I just wanted to mention before we um, wrapped up. Um, so we have uh, Delegate Bernice Miraku North on the call on this on this call. She is um, a Maryland delegate, and she also was one of the sponsors of the Maryland Maternal Health Act um, of 2024, um, and it's a, a bill that WDC also advocated for. So thank you, Bernice, for joining us. We really appreciate um, you being here. Um, and also, the other person I wanted to just acknowledge is Karen Brito. 
uh, Karen Brito was a former um, delegate for District 16, Maryland de uh, delegate uh, for District 16. And Karen was also a longtime chair of the Mar Montgomery County Democratic Party, uh, but Montgomery County Central De Democratic Central Committee. Um, and she is a mentor to so many people. And um, so she, and she just has been amazing. Um, an amazing mentor. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to flag for everyone and make sure that you're all thinking about it and sharing this. Um, for one, um, the, the Senate election is going to be crucial and we're going to need, look, all hands on deck. Um, we cannot afford to put Hogan in, in, you know, in the Senate. So I want people to like sort of take a look at that and hopefully you'll join us because we're going to be doing a lot of work um, this summer and this fall around the elections um, to elect uh, Angela and we've got three more women, two women, two additional women. So three women that we'd love to send to Congress um, to add to our, you know, our, so we no longer have an all male delegation. And so, you know, I think it's important for to have women representing us in, in Congress. And um, and finally, I, you know, I know that we didn't get the audience, the number of people that we would have loved to, because it's such an important topic. But what we will be doing is this will be available on our YouTube channel. So people can go, we can, you know, send people to this. Um, I think that gives an opportunity for more people to see it. We'll also send a link in our newsletter. So I think we have over a thousand subscribers and we have, you know, more than I think close to over 60% that open every newsletter that we send out. Um, so we will be sending this link. So I think more people will be able to see it. Um, and just thank you all. Um, this has been really an amazing presentation. I look forward to hearing more from you in the future. And thank you, Mona, for hosting. You did a great job. Thank you. Have Good night, everybody. Bye, Bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Great job. Good night. Good night.